Welcome to The Interview, a podcast by the Bailiwick Express. I'm Matthew Leach. This week I was joined by the CEO of Guernsey Electricity to talk about the recently released electricity strategy and the future of renewable energy. Alan Bates talks about how important the strategy is, why GEL supports it and how involved in its development the utility were. So I'm here today... We are recording, we are. I'm here today with um, Alan Bates, the CEO of Guernsey Electricity. Thank you very much for coming in to no talk to us. Um, very exciting time for the future of electricity and power generation in the islands. Um, of course, we've had the electricity strategy uh, been published, the proposal from um, the Committee for the Environment and Infrastructure. Um, Jell is clearly quite supportive of that, of that document. Um, why is that the case? Well, I think uh, in 2020, when we uh, had the energy policy approved by the states of Guernsey, it very much set out why we need to start changing, why the energy transition needs to happen. Uh, so that was a good positioning document. Uh, the electricity strategy for us is the what do we need to do, you know, very clearly s- setting up the strategic direction of the island. Uh, and for Guernsey Electricity now is, well, how do we do it? You know, how do you actually um, start delivering that electricity strategy? But, you know, for us, the, the pathway they've... Um, proposed pathway D is quite pragmatic we think it it allows us to take sensible investment decision steps to achieve it so for us it's uh, it's really good and we're very supportive and so um how uh, closely has gel been working with E&I on this and how much has has your involvement kind of influenced the way that the strategy has been developed so what I would say, um, the committee were really open at the very beginning to say we want to engage with the whole energy industry, even though it's electricity strategy. Uh, and I think that was very important because it's the energy transition we're talking about here, not the electricity transition. So they formed the energy partnership and we've been integral to the energy partnership with um, a lot of our colleagues in the energy industry. But also, why than even just the energy industry, you know, some really important other stakeholders in that as well have been involved in the consultation process. So I think that's gone very well. Uh, Evidence to that is, you know, it was released earlier this week and almost everyone's really positive about it. Um, so the status quo, what happens? Do, I mean, is there a... So we discuss about um, how, if this strategy is not uh, voted through, um, what happens after they're either which way? So if the status quo is re- maintained, do you have a plan then to immediately buy new equipment? Or if the strategy is agreed to, do you then start immediately decommissioning certain bits of equipment? So I think um, there is no decision on this one. A no decision is a decision to carry on in the sort of pathway we're currently in, which they call pathway A. Uh, That immediately says we've only got one interconnector. The type of risk we're trying to mitigate is a a subsidy cable failure. Now in the winter that could take up to six months to repair. So the type of generation plant you put at the power station is fundamentally different to if you've got two interconnectors, because then you're trying to prepare for a completely different type of uh, failure event, you know, a small hour, couple of hours or half a day interruption in France. So the type of kit you put in then is completely different. And generally that kit is cheaper to buy in terms of its capital investment, but more expensive to run. But the theory is you don't run it very often. You know, it, it rarely runs, it just sits there as backup. And so, so then if we have this strategy gets voted through and this is the direction we go, so that, that will that, Will that mean that certain bits of equipment then will be closed down, certain buildings? I know some one of the diesel generators is from the 1970s, and it sounds like you can't even get bits for it anymore. Um, what kind of process would have to, ha- have to happen then? So not immediately. Um, so obviously we have to maintain security supply. So for us, this is all about making sure there's enough electricity supply for when people want to use it. Um, and as a backup, we've got a security supply policy called N-2, and that pretty much says if we haven't got the cable you can lose your two largest generating plant and you can still hit peak demand. Um, so we can't just immediately uh, discount that. What we'd then start doing is um, planning for how we transition from that N minus two to hopefully N, so you, you have less generating capacity by the time the two new cable comes in. So we'll be maintaining that older plant for a bit longer. So it's not gonna be end of it immediately, the, the older plant? No, uh, I think we, we've come to the conclusion we're probably, uh, if we know we're getting a second interconnector or we, we hope to get a second interconnector, we'll start um, potentially buying some fast start gas turbine plants just to give us a bit more security, which means then we could start a phased retirement of some of the older engines. A lot, of, a lot has been made of the second interconnector 
Um, was, do you think this has always been inevitable, that we were going to have a direct link to France? Uh, I think one of the things we're seeing from the European energy market is their understanding that renewable generation is, is very intermittent. You know, we've just had a, a couple of weeks of very windy conditions, so it's been very good. Last year was very, very low on the wind resource um, for, for Northern Europe. Um, I think what they're saying is to cover that off is you can put lots of um, thermal based plant into your, into your own country or you can increase interconnection between the countries. And what we're seeing at the moment is lots of uh, activity around interconnection. And for us as well, you know, uh, what's key to covering off potentially a very intimate and renewable future is interconnection. So if it's not windy or sunny here, it might be windy or sunny somewhere else, such that there's a, a supply to be bought to the island. And of course, um, a lot of the uh, the strategy itself doesn't focus all on infrastructure. I mean, a lot of it is talking about um, exercises that need to be undertaken, including an account unbundling exercise. Um, for those who, it sounds a bit uh, impenetrable, but for people who don't understand what that means, what is that? So it's worth understanding that we have three licenses in the regulated market. We've got a license for generation, a license for conveyance, which is pretty much taking the electricity from where it's generated to where people want to use it. And we've got a supply license, which is, includes the retail activities and sale of electricity. Now, two of those we've had exclusivity in since um, the market was structured in the early 2000s. Um, but generation has been an open market from the very, very beginning. But there's been no, no market entrance into that. I think what they're trying to introduce with the electricity strategy is where competition adds greater value or greater or better cost to the customer or greater quality or greater uh, service, then it should be introduced in terms of the generation market. Um, now, if someone wants to invest in that generation market and put their own generation in, they need to have some transparency about how much they're going to get paid, how much it costs to connect, and they want to be assured that that's fair. So the accounting and bundling is really a case of we need to look at all our costs and where they're allocated and make sure they're allocated in the right place so we can give that transparency to any new market entrance. And you talk about costs there. I know you're quite keen to talk about making sure people understand that this isn't um, additional costs. Of course, the strategy it breaks down all the different pathways that we're going to be talking about and, and voting on and discussing in the coming months. Um, it's not going to cost us another £1.7 billion to pursue pathway D. It's going to... that's going to be less than what we would probably be doing anyway. Is that right? Yeah, and, and you know, I think if you just talk big numbers, then obviously it can uh, worry people in terms of what does that mean in terms of tariffs particularly. Uh, and what we're very keen to get across is that actually um, even pathway A, which is do nothing, as in keep just one power station and keep one cable and keep investing, is probably more expensive as about um, uh, £1.9 billion. Pounds. So these are all costs we would be seeing anyway and what we're doing or what the um, study by Siemens has done is optimise how we spend our money up to 2050. And actually they're suggesting that decarbonising uh, using local renewables, um, putting further interconnection is cheaper than not doing anything at all. So a, so a no vote would cost us about half a billion quid? Well, it's a, it, between 1.7 and 1.9, it's about 200 million pounds. Yeah. yeah. A, couple of, it's two, a couple of hundred million more based on the assumptions they've used to uh, do that analysis today. Now, I think one of the key things with all of this is, is this is strategic planning. It needs to be flexible and dynamic. And we need to take every so often reflect on what's changed in the market and make sure we follow the optimum path because you can't sort of set out now what it is definitely going to look like in 2050. Things will change. Um, of course, we want to move on to regulation as well. Uh, there was a proposal from e &I that... Um, um, the Committee for Economic Development should kind of investigate new ways of regulating the market. Um, do, you, uh, do you support this and how does this look different to how it's been regulated, A, by SDSB and B, by GCRA in the past? So I fully support that the, uh, the regulation needs to cover off the risk that exists in the market for, for ourselves, for new market entrants and for customers as well. Um, I think there's a lot of value with Guernsey owning Guernsey Electricity. I think there's a lot of control around um, what what its aspirations are and the and the policy talks about dividend expectations and, and such things. So I think I think that's that's important. Uh, it also depends on the complexity of the market. So if there's just us and one other competitor, then it doesn't need to be a very complex regulatory structure. If there's us and twenty other uh, market entrants, then you might actually say it does need to be more complex. So I think 
uh, regulation shouldn't just be set in stone on day one. It needs to evolve to, um, to meet the risks that are, are real within the market. And to talk about um, regulation, I think going forward, uh, Guernsey Electricity will probably be under more scrutiny as we talk about um, the future of um, uh, power generation in the island. And clearly E&I wants gel to be at the forefront of all that kind of stuff. And it's um, no secret from time to time we get the odd message from people who have their concerns allegedly from within jail, but you, you can never prove stuff yeah. like that. Um, I wanted to touch on just two points from, from that in particular. One being the, um, the billing system at Guernsey Electricity. Much has been made of that a couple of years ago is introduced. Where are we with that at the moment? And what does the future look like for the, for the system that you have in place? So uh, we introduced uh, a new sort of what essentially is a back office system that covers all our sort of uh, corporate service requirements. So it's not just billing, it's uh, accounting, it's asset management, it's HR, so the, the full package. Um, now, we, we introduced that during a global pandemic, which made it quite complex. Uh, and I would say it was probably the first time the company had done such a, a major change in its back office systems since the 1990s. Um, and not surprisingly, with all these sort of ERP type projects, there was issues when you when you go live. Um, I'm happy to say now they're, they're, they're substantially all sorted out. Um, so we're bidding customers, we're paying suppliers, you know, we're paying our employees. Um, and we're at the point now we're starting to enhance the system. So, you know, identifying where greater value can be, can be uh, gained from the, the investment we've made. Um, we had to do it though, you know, so I think, uh, did we have a choice not to buy a new system? No, the old system was obs obsolete and unsupported. So change had to happen. Um, as I say, you know, we couldn't have picked probably a worse time to be in the middle of go live uh, during the uh, sort of COVID era. Absolutely. I, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, your response on that one. Um, just the final point on that, I suppose. Um, are you, do you have confidence in the team assembled at Guernsey Electricity to take forward these kind of uh, proposals for a renewable future? Oh, just going back to the last point, I'd say um, I've worked in quite a few organisations in my career and my colleagues at Guns and Tristia are some of the most dedicated and loyal people I've ever worked with, um, with a real commitment to doing the right thing for the island. Um, and I think some of that sits within this sort of state ownership, you know, they, they, everyone really likes doing the right thing for the island, the right thing for the environment, um, the right thing for their fellow islanders. So I think that's really important. In terms of um, what we've got coming up ahead of us, uh, I think we're very, very good at um, running power stations, interconnectors, you know, networks. Mm. Uh, the area that we're now exploring is there's a lot being talked about smart grids, smart homes, the digitalization of um, energy, where not only can we think about where we get it from, we can also start to think more how do we use that wisely as an island. That's probably the area that we're going to probably expand our skills and our competence in is that digitalization, that future. Um, it's not set out yet. We're talking to some people from the UK. They're going through exactly the same um, realization that actually we're going to have to upskill. We're going to have to change from the economy we, we've seen in the past to the economy in the future. So no, I think the team's very dedicated, uh, loyal and committed. They do an excellent job. You know, they're out there overnight digging up roads to make sure the power stays on. They're there on Christmas Day making sure the power station's doing what it needs to do to make sure everyone cooks their Christmas dinner. As I say, a great team. And so how fast do you see this moving, this change towards what could possibly be within the proposal from E&I with wind farms and, and solar and all this kind of stuff? Uh, well, in terms of interconnection and uh, the power station, we're going to, once uh, and if the state's approved Pathway D, we'll go away very, very quickly and come up with our own strategic plan um, and business plan to deliver that. So I think the time scale is indicated in the policy letter in terms of generation on island and um, and the interconnection is something we look at. I think the sort of targets for local solar, the 5 and 10 megawatts by 2028, I think that's all achievable well. We can, can get straight on with that. When we start talking about offshore wind, these projects can take 5, 10, 15 years to come to fruition. Yeah. So they're very, very long scale. But what we need to do, and, and again, in the policy list, it highlights the creation of a sort of renewable energy commission to manage that process of how you deal with developers when they come along and, and how, we, how, we, how we work through. So there's a bit of um, building some foundations there that we need to do, but then, mm -hmm. you know, within those timescales, and, uh, you know, it, it might be offshore winds, it might be floating, it might be fixed. Who knows, tidal might have changed by then as well, and it could be tidal technology. 
So this is the point about keeping uh, minds open and being completely flexible uh, as the market develops. Are you supportive of it being um, publicly owned as opposed to kind of part of a, ju- a larger kind of multi-jurisdictional setup? I don't think we've got any hard and fast rules. And I think what Siemens have tried to say in their um, study is that if you want to go for the most cost-effective solution, so one where um, you're not having to pay someone else to take risk, you're not uh, having to pay someone else for returns or uh, yields out of a project, and you do it yourself, that's the, the most op- cost optimal way for the island to do. And I understand that, you know, that, and, and that's very, very true because, you know, we'd be looking to borrow money at a fairly low rate. There's not a very, very high return expectations out of going to interest because it's focused on doing the right thing for the islands. Um, But that said, I wouldn't discount the fact that, you know, it could be part of a larger wind farm. uh, It could be done by a third party. And and the whole point that PwC are putting forward is if that third party brings better cost and better quality, then why would you not use that third party? Do you have these conversations with Jersey? Are these? Do you, do you, are you close with your kind of, I guess, Jersey electricity? Are you close with your uh, counterparts over there? Yes, yeah, so um, Guernsey Electricity and Jersey Electricity have got a joint venture company called the Channel Islands Electricity Grid. We meet four times a year. And of course, these types of conversations, these big infrastructure conversations come up because the transmission company that is the Channel Islands Electricity Grid will be influenced by all these things. So the moment you start introducing very large-scale intermittent renewables, immediately your relationship with your um, power purchase agreement um, supplier changes. Um, it may change the, the grid connection relationship with uh, RTE in France. So um, we have to have these conversations. We have them all the time. Uh, I think the islands are roughly going in the same direction strategically in terms of both islands have got aspirations for offshore winds. Um, they, they've both got aspirations for the you know, net zero by 2050. So, yeah, we do have those conversations quite regularly. And how did, um, I know, I think this was maybe last year or the year before, there were these kind of spurious threats from France to cut the cable to get to the Channel Islands. I mean, how did those kind of political, uh, that kind of political discourse, did that kind of figure into the the thought process behind the next cable? So um, whilst we always say we're connected to France, we're actually connected to the European grid. And it's a very regulated grid in Europe. Um, with lots and lots of rules around it. Um, we've got a, a, a very tight contractual relationship with uh, um, a power provider, EDF. Um, so we weren't worried at all. Uh, it was a lot of um, political rhetoric around fishing. Um, we understand where it came from and why it's been used, but uh, we weren't concerned at that time around um, any sort of long-term impacts of being cut off. So we're pretty confident that a, a second cable, there's no issues there at all with our relationship with the uh, with the mainland i think you've always got to accept this geopolitical risk with any supply chain so whether it's uh, the supply of solar panels to the island wind turbines fuel oil coming to the islands they all come from you know none of these are in you know uh, built or, or made on the island so we have to be very aware there's supply chain risks with all of them and some of those supply chain risks will be geopolitical um but I'm reasonably confident we, we won't see any sort of long-term disruption from uh, connection to the European grid. And um, I just wanted to touch quickly because um, I've been speaking to uh, people in Alderney about their kind of umming and ahhing about tidal power. Um, why is tidal power not at the top of the agenda with this kind of conversation? Um, currently, it's, it's not a commercially viable technology. Um, uh, they're making great progress, um, uh, EMEC and Scotland, in terms of testing it. Um, but you know, I think they need to get some scale into that uh, into that technology to actually drive down prices. So um, I think this, the strike price is still over 100 um, pounds a megawatt hour. In fact, probably closing towards 200. Uh, that's a lot more than some of the more established technologies. I do, I do think there's a real advantage to Guernsey though in terms of tidal because whilst again it's intermittent. It's absolutely predictable. And one of the things, when you create value out of um, electricity generation, if you're what's known as dispatchable, as in you know when you're going to make it and you can actually sell it into the market, it's of much more value than if you're sort of intermittent without that sort of certainty. So uh, I'd never discount Tidal for Ordinary or, uh, or Guernsey. I think it's just a time thing. So it could come up in the future at I some think point. So, yeah. And that, again, another reason for being flexible. And um, I kind of wanted to draw it to a, to a close, talking okay. about the more um, political side of things, I suppose, because at the end of the day, 
this kind of falls to the vote of the same 40 people it always does mm -hmm. and um, I know you've been banging the drum about a, you know a no vote on this kind of uh, on renewables is a is a vote for fossil fuels um, how confident are you in the in the process in the next stage of the process that this will go the right way I'm very hopeful that um, the fact that we've seen the industry has been very, very supportive of this shows the sort of collaboration that's taken place uh, in its preparation. And, um, you know, deputies should take some assurance from that, that actually, and again, it's not making a hard and fast decision, it's setting out a strategic direction that we need to change if, it, if, if other factors change. So I think, you know, that confidence that uh, it's been well prepared, it's had some very good industry experts preparing it as well. It's it, it involved consultation with lots of stakeholder groups on the islands. As I say, I think it's um, a sensible way forward. Did you have um, uh, elec Guernsey Electricity employees like seconded to help develop the process? No. No. So um, we we uh, we get involved with bits where we have to provide technical information for consultants to to do their analysis. But no, um, it was sort of done independent of Guernsey Electricity. We, but as far as um, we weren't involved more than the energy partnership. Okay. Thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. No problem at all. Thank you for listening to The Interview, a Bailiwick Express podcast. If you liked what you heard, please like and subscribe. You can find us on all social media channels, and if you'd like to keep up to date on all the work the Express team does, please sign up to our daily email by visiting gsy.bailiwickexpress.com.